When you decided to watch a lesson on dialogue editing, you probably thought this would be about making shots match, good crossfades, perspective, noise reduction, scene transitions, or even dialogue premixes. But no, it's not about that. Instead, this lecture is about managing your time as a dialogue editor. Now imagine you're the greatest editor in the world. Your dialogue editing is brilliant, your control of scenes, your control of shots, your ability to manage noises, and your cinematic view of the way a film works, it's spectacular. So you're working on a six reel film, let's say. The first five reels, you are just amazing. And the producer is going, wow, this is the guy. I am so glad that I hired him. But let's say you get five perfect reels and don't finish the sixth reel. Well, suddenly you go from being a genius to being an idiot. And the producer will no longer say, wow, that's my man. And instead will say, who in the world hired this clown? Perhaps the most important part of dialogue editing is finishing the job. If you don't finish the job, all you are is a schmuck. Now, long ago, I used to run the mile, which for the rest of the world is called the 1600 meter. It's four laps around a track. I was fast and I was good for about three and a half laps. I was always out in front of the pack. I was quick. I was nimble. I could get around people. But then halfway through the fourth lap, I began to peter out. And I was no longer ahead of the crowd. I was in the middle. And by the time I got to the last curve, which is about 100 meters to go, I ran out of gas. And I never didn't finish the race, but I often didn't finish very well. Why? Because I didn't manage my resources well. I spent all of my energy on the first three quarters of the race, and then I passed out. Now, finally, somebody taught me how to manage my resources during a race, how to control my energy, how to control my expenditure of calories, and then I became a really good one-mile runner. So it's similar with dialogue. You have to learn how to pace yourself. If you learn how to pace yourself, you'll first of all learn how to get it done. You'll learn how to get it done based on how much money is available and how much time is available. And hopefully you'll learn how to get it done without killing yourself, without doing a job and having your, your lover say, never again, I don't want to see you anymore or coming home and your children don't recognize you, or your cats don't want to be with you. No, if you do things sensibly, you should be able to get the job done, get the job done well, get it done on budget and on time, and not kill yourself. That's what this program is about. So let's look at how to manage your time on a project. Now this sort of goes without saying, but before you begin the process of dialogue editing, you have to watch the film. Well, of course, otherwise you have no idea what you're up against. But you need to watch it under sensible viewing conditions, not in the picture editing room, not on a DVD at your house, ideally in the mix room, or if not, in a good editing room where you know how the sound in that room will translate into the final mix. Otherwise, you just don't know where to start. One of the secrets to finishing on time is to work in layers. By that, I mean, you don't start at the beginning of a film and do a perfect job, a perfect job, a perfect job through the film. The problem with that is that if something goes wrong, if there's changes in the film, if you get sick, if your child gets sick, if anything weird happens, you'll end up with a certain number of perfect reels and a certain number of reels that were either not done at all or were not done very well. So the way I get around this problem is to do it in layers. Now, there's a number of reasons why you want to work in layers as you do the dialogue. The first is that if you don't work in layers, you have no earthly idea where you stand at any given moment. You don't know from the first reel how well the third reel will go because they have very different issues. And you simply don't really know how to pace yourself. So it's like me running the mile, running too hard at the beginning, and then running out of steam. If you're working in one complete pass, in other words, perfect work all the way through, you don't really know what to do when you come to a problem. You don't know how relatively important this event is because you don't know what's coming after you. Now you might say, hey, but I watched the film, therefore I know what the issues are. No, you don't, because 
you have an idea of some of the things that happened during the screening. But as you all know, you don't really determine what the problems are until you get to them. So if you're working in passes, you will have a chance to get to know the various problems on the first pass. Maybe you can solve them then, or maybe you'll have to wait, put it off for another pass. The same basically goes for figuring out that age-old question, how good does it have to be? The ego part of you wants to make it perfect, of course, because then your mother will be proud of you and the director will think you're an absolute genius. However, you don't know what it takes to achieve a certain level of quality if you're working in one pass. If you're going in layers, you have a predetermined amount of time you can spend on any event. And therefore, if you exceed that time, you can either borrow that time from another place later in the film or earlier in the film, or just say, oh, it's the best I can do. Do it and move on. When I work in passes, I do the bulk of my work on the first pass, as you'll see soon. Now, there are many advantages of this, which we'll talk about later, but essentially, by doing a very good first run of the film, you will know what you have in front of you. You will be able to share this information with the rest of the crew, whether that's sound effects or backgrounds or the composer or whoever else. But it also serves another sort of morbid purpose, which is if I can get a pretty good cut going on the first run, and then on the way home I'm run over by a bus, or a 747 crashes on my head, or I have a fatal heart attack, then somebody else can pick up the film rather easily and uh, get it done. Of course, if I am run over by a bus or hit by a 747, I don't really care, but it seems like the right thing to do. Finally, if you are working in passes, as I suggest, it's easy for you to provide update mixes to the other editors. Remember, it's very hard for a backgrounds editor to make subtle, beautiful, elegant backgrounds when all he's working with is the OMF that's going eh, oh, eh, oh, uh. It's very hard to be sensitive. Similarly, it's hard on the effects editor to make a the sound of a feather falling on the snow when the OMF is bumpy and loud. So by going in passes, you are able to update the other people on the sound crew so that they're always just behind your progress and you can all move along together. I typically work in three passes unless I have a very tight budget. So for the sake of this demo, we're gonna do that, three passes. So the first pass is really the big pass. That's where most of the work is done. It's by far the most complicated, and it takes up about two-thirds to three-quarter of your sound budget. This is where the general edit decisions are made. It's here where you decide, can this be fixed or not? It's here where you go back to alternate takes, where you look for possible solutions. It's here where you get rid of most of the, of the noises and the clicks and the bad articulations. And it's also here where you do the bulk of your ADR spotting. The next pass is sort of a fine cut. Typically, the director and or the picture editor and or the producer will look at your cut near the end of the first pass. Then there will be fine cut issues. These could be things that you just left behind on the first cut, either because you didn't know how to do it or you got sick of it or you realize that you were beating your head against the wall, and if only you'd leave it for a few days, you could come back and do an excellent job. So for whatever reason, the second pass is for cleaning stuff up, making it nice, making it cleaner, and doing the final ADR spotting. So by the end of the second pass, you're pretty well ready to go for the ADR recording. The third pass is after ADR recording. It's where you're cutting the ADR, you're getting your final approval from the director and the rest of the production types. You do the cleanups, you get it ready for the mix, and basically you finish the ADR. Now, these steps, as I said before, depend on the amount of time you have, the amount of money, and also your sort of own quirky ways of working. So having to find the basic passes, at least as I see it, we're gonna go through now and look at what each of these processes means in the dialogue process. Now, this is only a superficial overview of the processes. So if you want to know more, take a look at the book. Pass number one. The first thing you got to do is get organized. Now, as I've said in other videos, 
Getting organized is of paramount importance because if you don't start off organized, you're doomed. You have to be able to get everything so that it's ready to go and that when you're actually editing, you can just edit, 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 and not really worry about the infrastructure of the alternate takes, the paperwork, and all these things. It's much like making Chinese food. You start off with cutting, 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 cutting. You have every bowl you own full of something. And the actual cooking, which you do in a walk, takes no time at all, but it's all about preparation. So what are the things you need to do? You need to get your workstation ready, meaning you've got to clear some disk space, you've got to make sure the computer is happy, you know, you've got to make sure it works. You then have to get all the material that you need from the production. There's a list of these in previous videos as well as in the book, so there's really no point going through the list right now. You need to organize the material that's coming to you. I'll call it the paperwork, but of course there's no longer any paper involved, so it's sort of the file work, including things like your EDLs, your sound reports, lists of characters, just all these things that you need to get started. You need to find your wild sound and get it organized. You have to create a template if you're doing a multi-reel film and you have, let's say, 25 tracks, you really don't want to type all these track names many, many times. So you make a template, do it once, copy it for your other reels, and off you go. And finally, as you're getting started, you have to figure out how you're going to back up your material, both your uh, files as well as your sessions. Because if you do not back things up, and if you have a significant computer crash and you lose everything, I will not feel sorry for you. Now, onto the actual editing in the first pass. And like you see, it's a pretty it's a pretty big list because remember, the first pass is at least when I do it, it's the bulk of the work. Okay, you organize your tracks by shot and or microphone. In other words, you get it so that you can edit it and also so that you can mix it down the line you need to mark your scene boundaries. In other words, where does scene two start? Where does scene three start? And so forth. This will pay off down the line, but it will also make you a hero with the sound effects and backgrounds people. You need to basically level your regions so that the mixer won't hate you. Deal with major transient or impulsive noises like clicks and pops and teeth stuff and all this stuff because you have to do that. You need to make good scene transitions so that you have whatever the appropriate length of change between scenes one and two, you have it down for every scene. Typically, these are very fast transitions. Once you finish an initial pass and it's level and smooth and a lot of the noises are reduced, probably no real noise reduction at this stage, but it's nice, then you make a mono mix for everybody else the sound designer, the effects editor, the background editor, the composer, the Foley people, so that they have something nice and clean to work with. You need to spot the ADR. Now that's basically two things. There are your technical calls. Most of the things that you call will be purely technical. Something is too noisy. Something has noises and clicks and distortion. Uh, there's a bad articulation. There is a dolly noise. The list is endless. There will also, though, be calls that the director or the picture editor or somebody else want. These are typically about acting or about adding lines that help the narrative or changing something. So you take your takes and the director's takes and you begin to create the ADR spotting. Once you've done the initial spotting, you need to make a list of how many lines each character has, more or less. This is important so that the production office can begin to schedule the actors for ADR. Okay, pass one is over. Let's move on to pass two. During pass two, you're dealing with all these little things you left behind on the first pass. Maybe because you just didn't want to do it. Maybe because you didn't have the inspiration to do it. Who knows why? But there's always little dead bodies that you leave behind in the first pass, and now it's time to deal with those bodies. Now that you've had a little bit of distance from the film because you took a break to do ADR spotting, you can better look at your shot transitions and see what works and what doesn't. 
Remember, very often, a little bit of distance will sort out many problems and give you the truth. For example, in any pass, if I have a problem that proves to be very, very difficult, I will often just put a note that says, fix me now, that means come back and deal with me. Often, especially at the end of the day, I get stupid. I try and try and try to solve a problem basically by beating my head against the wall. I know that if I just leave it and come back the next day or the next week, I'll usually be able to solve this problem more or less immediately. So the second pass is this. It's a chance to simply go back and deal with things that you have not previously dealt with. Once you kill off the big problems, the secondary problems sort of rise to the surface, and suddenly you're confronted with things you never heard before because you were too occupied with the disasters. The second pass, now that you're beginning it with a much, much better cut than you began the first pass with, you can now deal with things you've never heard. More little noises, more articulation problems, more acting issues, all sorts of things that you're now free to deal with. Second pass, you got to screen everything once again to the director, show him or her your list of ADR calls, and make sure the ADR is ready to go. Remember, if you don't get the list right before the ADR recording, you'll never get it right. The ADR session is not a good time to add lines because of the way it's recorded. Remember, ADR is not recorded in film sequence, but it is recorded in acting sequence or character sequence. So this means that you got to get that list right. So the second pass is a time to review it with the director and then go back on your own, review it yet again, because you've got to get it right. And if you get something wrong for the ADR, they will never forgive you. Been there, done that. Once you finish the ADR spotting and pass two, it's time for the ADR recording. Now you may or may not be a part of the ADR recording process. It depends on all sorts of things. The budget, the time, how big the crew is, what your particular skills are. You just don't know. But whether you're in or out of the process, there are certain things you absolutely have to be sure of. So when the time comes to edit the tracks, you can do it and you don't go mad. First thing, because ADR is so complicated as far as keeping track of things, your paperwork must be perfect. Now let's imagine that we have a, a film with 500 ADR lines, okay? And let's say that each line has 10 takes. That's 5,000 sound files right there. Now, Keep in mind also that when you edit the ADR, it's at the worst possible time in the process to be inefficient. It's right up against the mix. You're in a hurry. You've got all sorts of other things to deal with. You need to be efficient. So you absolutely must have a system which works in order to keep your paperwork and your file names and your editing all in sync. Otherwise, you're simply doomed to a great big mess. Now, all of this is expressed in much more detail in the book, so there's absolutely no reason to go through with it now. While you're recording, you've got to get the match right, the voice match. Now, there's this ridiculous myth that says, oh, no, we'll just get it recorded. We can fix it in the mix. This is absolute baloney. The time you get it right is in the recording. That involves microphone choice, microphone placement, and acting. Of the three of these, by far the most important is acting. If the acting is not right, if the energy is not right, if the pitch, the cadence, whatever is not right, you'll never match it in. Acting is everything. So if you're in the session, and if you're the person responsible for making it work, you've got to get the acting right. Now, there's other things like, you know, like I said, there's microphone, there's acoustic, there's all sorts of things which are equally important. But if you can't nail the acting, you have no chance whatsoever of success in matching this into your cut. As I mentioned, you're going to be generating zillions of takes, zillions of sound files. So just once again, make sure that the sound file names 
correspond to the spotting names on your list so that you can have some sort of piece when you cut the ADR. And again, if you are the person in charge of the ADR, you're the person who has to make it work. So sometimes you have to be the bad guy in the ADR recording session. And everybody's tired. Everybody wants to go home. You know the actor cannot possibly pull it off, but you got to do it once again because you got to get it right. Because if it's not right, it's not right. The ADR is recorded. Great. Now it's time to deal with the final pass. The biggest part of this final pass for me is cutting the ADR. Now, how long does it take to cut it? It depends, but I have a general rule that it takes about the same amount of time to cut it as it did to record it. Now, this is ridiculously simplistic, but hey, you got to start somewhere. So if there's five days of recording, I figure I need about five days max to cut the ADR. It's a good place to start. Finally, the ADR is cut in, you've cleaned it up, everything is nice. Sit back, back of the room, drink a cup of coffee, drink a beer, whatever it is that makes you comfortable, watch the movie a couple of times. Look for flow issues. You'll also find little clicks and clacks and clunks that you never heard before, but mostly you're concerned about does it work? Does this dialogue flow smoothly? Now, of course, you've not mixed it yet, so it's not going to be that smooth, but make sure it works. Make sure there are no obstacles getting in the way of the story because of you. One more time, you will screen this thing to the director. It's the final check before the mix. Now, by this time, you're probably sick of the director and you don't want to have yet another screening, but there is a reason for this. ADR is a pretty volatile thing. During the recording, the director might have gone, oh yeah, take seven, that's the one, that's the one. So you cut, take seven. However, once it's cut in, the director might kind of forget that she wanted take seven and wants to hear all the other takes. Now, it's a drag to do this in the cutting room, but it's a much bigger drag to do this in the mix. The idea is that all the pain of the dialogue premix should be dumped onto you in the editing room, at least as much as possible, because things like listening to alternate ADR lines in the mix are not only stupidly expensive, but they also sort of break the rhythm of the dialogue premix and bring down everyone's energy. So deal with ADR calls in the cutting room. And quite honestly, if you either have an alternate take or an ADR line, that you have this feeling deep in your gut of, oh, this is a problem, this could be a problem, now is not the time to pretend you don't know about it. Bring it up. If you think there is a problem, there probably is a problem. So talk to the director about it, show him these things, and make sure that everything is happy before you proceed on to the mix. Once you finish making everything nice, the director has approved everything, it's time to get everything ready for the dialogue premix. This is where you get the sessions ready. You do things like make sure that every track is the same on every session, even if you don't use a track on a certain reel. Make sure it's all the same, otherwise you're going to cause grief in the dialogue premix. You need to archive everything. You know, you need to put it on drives, you need to back it up, you need to make it so that when you close your cutting room, the film is safe. I typically back it onto two drives that I leave at the studio where I'm working, and at least for a while, I keep it onto a portable drive that stays with me all the time. There's two reasons for this. The biggest is if there is a fire or a flood at the studio, or if the studio owner decides to sell the place and open a bar, even if I can't get to the original sessions, I have my backup drive, so I'm safe. And the other is this. If you teach, if you write a book or something, it's good to have this material on hand so that you can do demos. Of course, you don't own it, so you got to ask permission, but get the material and then ask. Also, during this uh, preparation time, you want to pull out any production effects from your tracks so that it's more useful during the mix, and when the m and &E is made, it's simply easier to mix. Okay, we have finished editing. Now we're doing the dialogue premix. What is your job in the dialogue premix? Well, one is to participate with the mixer so that you can guide him or her through the process. You know the tracks. You know what you were thinking. You know the problems. So you can be sort of a tour guide. 
Another is this. No matter how brilliant you are during your editing, there will be issues. There will be problems that happen. There will be mistakes that you made. And there will also be things that you, the mixer, the director, or the cleaning person want to fix. So you are there running the audio workstation. And if there's something to move, you move it. That's a very important job because the odds are good that you have better skills on your Pro Tools or Nuendo or Pyramix or whatever than does the mixer. Who has other skills? And finally, you have a certain interpretation of the film. The mixer has an interpretation also. Now let's be honest. The mixer is sort of more important than us, but nonetheless, your opinion, my opinion, is very important. So if you feel that the mixer is going in a direction aesthetically or in a narrative sense that you don't like, talk about it, fight about it, do whatever. Don't be a jerk. Don't bring a gun to the mix, but work it out. So typically in a perfect mix, you have an idea, the mixer has an idea, but what is finally done is better than either of you would have done originally, so it's all nice. What we're going to look at now is breaking down the steps into numbers so that you can gain some sort of an idea of how to pace yourself. The idea behind this is to organize your time such that at any given step, and in fact on any given day, you know how much you have to do in order to stay on schedule. Again, if you simply start at the beginning of the film and make it wonderful as you progress through the film, you never really know where you stand because you don't know the nature of the problems lying in front of you, and you don't really know when can you go home on any given day. Now that we've gone through these steps in rather grotesque detail, Let's make some sense of it and let's see how this can actually help you to manage your time when you're cutting the dialogue. Let's imagine we have a film that has a budget of 300 hours for the dialogue package. Now, the dialogue package typically means the dialogue editing, the ADR, and the dialogue premix. Now, normally when I budget things, I'm just budgeting for my time and the ADR package and the dialogue premix or somebody else's problems. But in this case, we're going to do the whole shebang. As we saw many pages ago, you've got to be organized before you can start. So the first thing right off the bat is about a day's worth, maybe two days, of getting everything organized, getting your paperwork together, finding the wild sound, you know, yada yada, we've been there. Next is the big one, dialing editing pass number one. Remember, this is where almost everything gets done. So I gave it a huge percentage of 40% of the whole package. Now, if we were looking at only my time, the dialogue editor's time, it would be a much higher percentage because it's not competing with the ADR or the dialogue premix. But as you see, it's the biggest number in the list. Next, dialogue editing pass number two, which includes the final ADR spotting, it's 11%. Again, these numbers, I'll tell you later how I came up with them, but you know, they're yes and no, kind of close, quasi-real. ADR recording. Of course, it depends on the film. It depends on the kind of film. It depends on how screwed up your original production tracks are. It depends on how crazy the director wants to be as far as making acting changes or making narrative changes. But this is a decent percentage to start with. The ADR editing and Pass 3 edit, again, it's a little more than Pass 2, but it's more or less in the same area. When you finish cutting, everything's wonderful, the director loves you, pack it up for the premix. You know, archive, get your tracks right, make sure that on every reel you have the same number of tracks with the same names. Even if you're not using a certain track on that reel, it's got to be there and be muted. The dialogue premix. It is what it is what it is. I say 15%. It's a good number. Contingency. What is contingency? We as human beings have a tendency to base all of our calculations on best case. So when you're planning to, let's say a contractor is going to come to your apartment and redo your bathroom and he says, I can do it in a week. You're an absolute fool if you believe him. Of course it's going to take longer. Of course it's going to cost more. That's just the nature of life. We always think, oh, everything will be fine. 
everything is usually not fine. Contingency is a certain amount of your time that you've simply put away, put in the closet, forget that it exists. This way, if your computer breaks, if the director comes by with a lot of changes, if you get sick, if your cat gets sick, anything weird that you didn't anticipate, you steal it from the contingency. That way you're not going over time or over budget. Meetings and screenings. You, th you forget these things, but you have to have them. Of course, you have to screen your film probably three times to the director and maybe the picture editor. But there's also phone calls, there's meetings with the producer, there's talking to the lab. There's all this stuff you just got to do that you forget to put in the budget. So these are the basic budget items. Now, how did I come up with these numbers? Did I just make them up? Well, not really. There's a certain amount of fantasy in here, but for the most part, these are good numbers. The reason I know is that I have an Excel spreadsheet of every film I've worked on for the past 15 years. In that spreadsheet, for every day I work, there is the date, there's the start time, there's the stop time, there's the downtime, and there's what did I do that day. In other words, was it screen with the director? Was it real three dialogue pass one? Was it spot ADR or maybe supervised dialogue premix? You know, goodness knows what it could be. But I have a very, very tight control over this film, so I know pretty well precisely what I did during this process. Now, this crazy, neurotic amount of bookkeeping has two basic benefits. The first is I keep track of how much time I'm working. Now, Let's say I decide to take a film for X number of dollars. If I do X plus 10%, you know, who cares? But if suddenly it's becoming 2X as far as the amount of time, I need to complain. I need to talk to the producer. By having a very accurate record of how much time I'm working, I have something to talk about. But the real advantage of having a, a system like this is that I know how much each kind of film works. I know how much ADR, how much dialogue premix, how much first pass, each kind of film works. So if I get a new film, I watch it and I think, hmm, what does this film remind me of? Which films that I've done in the last few years had more or less the same issues, whether it's technical issues like noises or aesthetic issues or director issues? This way I can think, okay, let's look at these other films, look at the timesheets, and see how much time I spent on these films and what, how much I spent doing past one, past two, ADR, and so forth. This way I can first go to the producer and say, okay, based on this film and previous history, I feel that I need this amount of time to do your film. Of course, the producer will say, well, that's very interesting. I'm very happy that you came up with these numbers. However, I don't care because I have only two-thirds the budget that you need. Okay, so you're faced with a dilemma. You can either say, forget it, go away, but, you know, you need the work. So you can then say, okay, I'll be back tomorrow with an answer. You go back, you look at your spreadsheets, and you see, okay, can I do this film for two-thirds of what I think it should be and, one, do a decent job Two, finish it on schedule. And three, not wreck my life. And finally, having done that, I can then make a chart like the one you're looking at now and kind of break it down to figure out what must I do at every step. Now, once you have come up with these ratios, it's time to make some sense of it. What I've done, I've taken the 300-hour budget and I've simply multiplied it by the percentages here on the previous page. So you come up with these numbers. You can read, so there's no point reading the numbers to you, but you get the drift of how many hours are available at every step. Now, why should you care? Because this is the secret to getting through the process. This is the secret of doing a good job. This is the secret of doing a good job on time. This is the secret of not wrecking your life. Let's look at each step in the process and figure out just how fast we need to work. Now, let's take our 
film we were talking about. It's 110 minutes, which is six reels in this case. And let's assume you can work eight hours of productive time a day. That, is, that means you're probably at work nine hours. Let's see, you're getting paid for nine hours. You know, you have breaks. You have to go to the toilet occasionally. You need to eat lunch. You need to call your girlfriend. You need to check on your cat. So you end up with eight effective hours. So organization, well, that's not by the hour. That's just you need to spend, let's say, a day doing it. Editing past one. Given these numbers, it means that on any given day during past one, I need to accomplish seven movie minutes per day. So if I start on reel one and I start at one hour, it means that at the end of the day, I really ought to be around seven minutes into the film. Now, if I can't, if I hit a really bad scene, if I'm stupid that day, which happens, you know, you have good days and you have bad days. If I only get five minutes done that day, no problem. You just know that you owe the film two minutes. So that by the end of pass one, you have done it in 120 hours. Okay, fair enough. Editing pass two. Well, there's not that much to do in pass two. You're just sort of cleaning things up and you are doing your final ADR spotting. So you need to cover like 27 minutes of film a day. Now, that's not a lot of editing. That's just spotting, cleaning things up, and off you go. ADR editing, pass three, track prep and all this stuff. At the ratio that I gave it, you need to accomplish 23 film minutes in a day. It seems like a lot, but you have to remember, what are you doing? It's not that time-consuming. Mix prep, you know, it's half a day, so there's no ratios there. The dialogue premix, at the numbers that I provided and at the ratio that I provided, you need to mix 19 minutes. In other words, basically a reel a day in order to stay on schedule. Now, this is a really valuable number because it tells you, are you mixing on schedule? Now, remember, the dialogue premix is typically much, much more expensive than your editing room. All the editing room is, you know, a room with a computer, and you. Not a whole lot of cost. The mix room is a big room with lots of equipment, probably a console, acoustic treatment, a projector, a screen, all this stuff, so you don't want to waste your time. So this number tells you, are you on schedule? Now, it's almost certain that on the first day of a dialogue premix or the first day of a dialogue edit, it's going to be slow because you're trying to find your footing. You're trying to figure out where do you stand. So all it means is that, okay, I'm supposed to be a reel a day. I'm not. I only did three quarters of a reel on this day. So you got to pick it up later. But if you didn't have these numbers, you'd be in a vacuum and you just go, oh my God, oh my God, where am I? And again, contingency is something. It's like half a day or something that the film owes you if you run into trouble. Now, how did I come up with how fast do you have to work every day? Well, the math is simple. The minutes per day, which is the seven minutes of film a day or 27 minutes of film a day, whatever it is, is a formula. It's the length of the film divided by the budget hours divided by the hours per day. This is not rocket science, but it's very, very important because it helps you to understand where are you today. And it doesn't mean that you're dividing the film up into, I've got to do this many minutes every day. No. You have to do this many minutes per day based on what process you're in right now. So what's the point of this? The primary point is to tell you, are you on schedule? How fast do you have to work? Um, it's like, you know, children need boundaries. You can only flourish with boundaries. You can only work with freedom, I think, in a dialogue edit if you know what your limits are that day. Otherwise, you go nuts. Remember that every step has its own rhythm. The dialogue past one is slow. The dialogue past two and three are very fast. So you have to accomplish more every day. And again, if you find yourself behind one day, borrow it from tomorrow. If you find yourself ahead, wow, it means money in the bank so that when there's a rainy day, you have something to fall back on. As I mentioned half an hour ago, this system is very handy for telling you how good does it really need to be. Everybody hates that question because you think, oh, it has to be perfect. Well, forget it. Nothing is perfect. 
And as much as we are artists, as much as we take pride in what we do, I mean, I love what I do, and I'm very, very proud of my work. However, let's be reasonable. There's two things you must consider. First of all, it's a job. There comes a point in life where you get tired of giving everything away, and you're really not helping yourself if you just keep giving away time, giving away time, because it's just lowering your value on the market. Another reason is that it tells you, based on this amount of time, how much time can you spend fixing this problem? In other words, there's a point at which you just have to say, well, it's not going to get any better because I don't have the time. I don't have the calendar time, and I don't have the budget time. And yes, I'll stay another hour maybe to help solve this problem, but I'm not going to give you my life because we have a life. Then again, if you want to, it's up to you. If you really think, I've got to get this absolutely right, then do it with my blessing. But at least by knowing what your times are, you can make that choice intelligently. And one thing I also like to do, this is just based on my own kind of weird personality, but I typically work very hard at the beginning of a project and then sort of slack off as it goes. Partly this is just the way my energy works. I'm very energized at the beginning of a project, just like I'm very energized in the morning. And by late afternoon, I'm getting kind of stupid and I want to go home. So over the course of a project, I try to be really gung-ho in the beginning. That way at the end, when everybody else is working like a mule, I don't have to. I go home and say bye when I know I'll see them the next day when I come to work. So it's just a personal thing. But there is one more advantage, which is by working hard at the beginning, you have a pretty good idea of what you're up against. And then as time goes, as the project progresses, you have the choice of continuing to really work hard or if it's going well, you can slack off. But if you don't start working hard, then at the end you're going, oh my God, oh my God, and you have no choice. Again, this is not a system. This is just the way I like to work personally. So that's it for my plan for managing time. Must you do this? Of course not. Must you work in three passes like I do? Of course you don't need to. You can work in two passes. You can work in five passes. That's up to you, to the film, to the studio where you're working, and to your own quirky behavior. But I hope you see the value in working in layers rather than just beginning at the film, start, and keep going. Because by working in layers, you have much more control over your time. You know how hard you have to work any given day. You know where you can let up. You have a much more standard quality for the whole product rather than it being sort of spotty. Now, sort of unrelated to this, but it's something I'll, I also do, I don't like to edit the film in order. I like to start somewhere in the middle and work my way out. Now, a lot of this is simply superstition. I, I think, oh, I have to work in this manner. But there is a certain logic to it. Changes can happen anywhere in a film, and they do. However, I have this strategy that the most vulnerable parts of a story are the beginning and at the end, because at the beginning you have all this exposition, at the end you have all of this conclusion, and maybe in the middle it's a little bit more stable. So if the film is not exactly set yet, I typically work on the inside and go out. Of course, the first thing I do is I ask the editor, okay, what do you think is safe? And I work on those first. But the other thing is this, when you're first starting on a film, you don't know anything about it. You have sort of a weak spot as to how to handle both the narrative sides, the construction sides, and also sort of, you know, the spiritual life of the tracks themselves. So whatever reel I cut first might be sort of weak because I haven't really made peace with the personality of the film. If I start that learning process at the beginning, it might be exposed. If I start at the end, people might be aware of, ooh, that's weak. But if I start in the middle, it's possible I can bury my relatively weak editing in the middle so you don't notice it so much on the stuff that's really visible. So that's enough for now on how to manage your time. I hope it's useful, I hope you make some sense of it, and I hope you realize you don't have to die. You really can control your time, and to a certain extent, you can even control your life while you're working on a film. So, thanks, and bye.